James, book of James calls it the word of truth. The word of truth. That's the word of God. Yeah, that's right. God tells the truth. And what is true belongs to God. So the world makes up a lot of things and uh, carries a lot of messages forth that aren't true. But God's the author of truth. And so if it's true, it comes down from the Father of lights, according to the book of James, in which God never uh, circles around the back door. God never is two-faced. God is always right up front. He gives only good things as opposed to sinful things. Sometimes unpleasant things are good things. I'm not saying everything God gives is enjoyable, because how many of you have been touched by the Lord with something that was not enjoyable? Let me just see you. Yeah, yeah. a lot of you have been touched by stuff that when it touched you, you it wasn't fun. It wasn't pleasurable. But what it did to you was something that couldn't be done in any other way. And it increased you and it strengthened you. And now you are a better man or a better woman or you're more prepared. You're more mature. You see life in a different way. You're not that little child and that Im little immature person that you used to be because God has spoken to you in his word, has placed uh, circumstances in your path, has allowed the enemy to do his best to damage you and to tempt you into things, but has protected you and guarded you because you had enough wisdom to hang on to him and he brought you through something that was intended to kill you in a positive way so that you could be blessed and you many times can't see that through the windshield of your life. Yeah. You can only see it through the rear view mirror. And as you look back, you go, my goodness, I can't believe how, how much God did in that little period of time in my life. But, uh, but trust him now is what yeah. James is saying. James is saying, look, don't get caught up in the fact that everything that happens in your life uh, you're, you're, you're made to believe is, is from God, that there are different things that happen in your life, and some of them are temptations for you to do evil and to fail and to fall and make no mistake about it. That comes from the prince of the power of the air, the prince of darkness that God has allowed to have free, ro free roam in some of the sections of life nowadays, according to Ephesians 2. But remember that a prince is always subject to the king, and the king is in control, and the prince is only allowed to do what the king will let him do. And so the prince of the power of the air has some control, has some sway, has some things that he can do, and he tries to do those things in our life that will defeat us and destroy us and conquer us and lead us down and betray us and carry us into despair. But God has a greater law than the prince of darkness. The king has said, only good stuff I'm going to let come to you that will bless you and carry you. And if you'll trust me in the midst of all of this confusion or chaos or hurt or pain or whatever it might be in life, I'm going to make you a better person. I'm going to mature you, which James says, perfect you, which means I am in the process of making you perfect. How many of you are aware and you're not going to really ever be truly perfect this side of heaven? Are you aware of that? Yeah, I don't think any of us believe that somehow I'm going to wake up one day and be perfect. Even the fact that I might think that is imperfect, you know, in itself. But it doesn't mean that every day I'm not striving to be perfect. I'm not striving to be like more like Christ. That's what our life is all about. So there we go with the introduction of what James basically says in the first 18, 17, 18 verses in this chapter. And he's been trying to carry us through this with different similes and different uh, stories and different uh, glimpses at, at how to look at these things so that they will make sense to us so that we can grasp on to the things that we need to grasp on to. So now I'm just going to kind of scan through some stuff that we've already been through. So um, this is how we are to receive the Word of God, and you have it in the other outline. <clears throat> I've just left it in, on the screen so you could kind of get back and you can remember some of the things that have been said before we jump in today. Uh, how we are to receive the Word of God quickly. Everyone be swift to hear is what he said. Quietly, everybody be slow to speak. Uh, quit talking and start listening. 
You ought to listen more than you talk. Many people get in trouble and don't receive from God because they're too busy talking to hear anything God will say. Be quiet and let God speak to you and quit talking about stuff you don't know anything about. Quit trying to teach somebody something you don't know yourself. Allow God to speak through you. Be quiet and let him, let him use you and, and train your spirit and anoint you so that when you talk, you say the right things and people can be blessed and not cursed by the things you say. So how do we receive the word of God? We receive it quickly. We don't receive everything quickly. In other words, there are lots of things in life to listen to that we need to avoid at all cost. There are things that you're listening to uh, in your hands, in your pockets, on your TV, in your automobiles. I mean, there's all kinds of garbage and trash and diversions and divisions and, and bad news and, and, and divisive things that you just fill yourself up with. And, and the question is, how do you think you can fill yourself up with all of these contrary things of God and be anything but contrary to God? Well, you, James says you can't do that. Listen to the word of God quickly is what he says. And, and quit talking and let God speak to your heart. This is how you hear the word of God. Calmly means, you know, uh, don't, be, don't, don't be fighting around. Uh, uh, don't be fretting around. Don't let anger be so strong in you that it hinders the word of God, that deep seething anger that he calls wrath. Wrath is the outward explosion of anger is what wrath means. If you look it up in the dictionary, it's that part where when your teenage child is told to take out the garbage and they don't want to do it and, they, and then you make them do it and then, when they, and then when they come back in the back door, all of a sudden, slam! Well, that slam is wrath. That slam is the outward expression of an inward anger. It means that they are angry enough to let their anger show on the outside. And James says you can't receive the word of God like that. That anger will keep you from receiving the word of God. So receive it calmly. And then he says receive it purely, just like Brother Charles would pick lint off an outfit because he couldn't stand it. Because he couldn't stand to have a piece of lint on this Cosmo wardrobe he's got on. Um, he would very quickly and suddenly uh, pick that off and say, you know, get... And he would notice it very quickly because he's so, he's so intricately and superbly dressed that it would be completely noticeable immediately that there was a piece of lint or, or, or some dirt. And, and he would have to, you know, oh, no, this has got to go and change clothes because it, you, you can't be spotted like that. You can't be, your life can't be, can't be spotted and dirty. And, you know, uh, that's what he says, lay aside all filthiness and the superfluity of naughtiness, the old words were. That, that, that medical term for earwax, you know, the, the, the sin is like earwax. It blocks you. It hinders you from hearing what the Word of God says. So it says quickly deal with these things so that the, the, you can be pure in life and God can speak to you. And then meekly just means under control. And we talked to that, talked about Jesus doing that. When you know, We talked about uh, Moses being meek and Jesus being meek. So meek doesn't mean weak. Tell your neighbor, meek is not weak. Matter of fact, meek is really strong. Meek means even though I have the strength to mash you, I don't do it. I keep myself under control, even though I could overpower you, and I'm stronger than you, and I'm bigger than you, and I could do whatever I want to to you, I do not choose to do this because I am under control. I am not out of control. I am not in charge. It's not what I want to do. It's what God wants to do to me and through me, and so... This is how you receive the Word of God. These are instructions. You, you receive them quickly. You receive them quietly. You receive them calmly. You receive them purely. And you receive them meekly. And then James moves on, and here's where we are today. And he moves on, and he says, I'm going to tell you what the Word of God is like so you can get an idea in your heart what the Word of God really is like. Because I think many people are not aware of how God intends for his word to be used in your life. Would it help you to kind of have an outlook on 
what, how God uses his word in your life, like how it goes? Would that be helpful to you? Would that, you know, I mean, or you already know how he uses it in your life? Well, James says, all right, let me, let me say three things about the word of God. Let me give you three pictures of the word of God so you can know what God intends to do with his word in your life. When you come to church and I stand up and I say, turn to verse so-and-so and so-and-so, uh, and then I start preaching about verse so-and-so and move on to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one, why, why would God do this? Why would God say these things to us? Well, James says that the word of God, the word of truth is like three things. In English, these are called similes, you know? I know a lot of people think they're metaphors or whatever, but no, they're a simile. The Word of God is like, and here's the first one. It goes in your blank. The Word of God is like a strong root that has been engrafted in you. You are to quickly strip away any hindrances that would block you from receiving the, God, uh, receiving the Word of God. And with strength that is under control, you are to allow the Holy Spirit to engraft the Word of God to you. Do you understand what engraft means? How many uh, agricultural people do we have here that have engrafted something agriculturally? You know, you've taken one species of, and then cut the other species and then engrafted, placed on the stem of one, the, the, the branch of another, and then uh, put them together and let them grow. So now this part becomes part of this part. That's engrafting. And what, and what James says is God's intention is that when you are pure and when you are meek and when you are listening to God, God is still speaking to you as long as you are listening to him. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah. I know a lot of people think God's not speaking anymore, but it's not true. God is speaking loud and clear, first of all, to those who will hear and to those who are quiet enough that he can say something and you can hear it. And so he says, he, he says, all right, the word of God, if you, want to get a, if you want to get a picture of it, the word of God is like something that engrafts itself to you. Uh, it, the word is intended to become not just an add-on to your life, but something that's now part of you, that is, that, is, that is strength on the inside, that grabs hold of you and gives you a strength and bears you up and brings a stability in your life that will allow you to bear up under the pressures of life. Others can't do this. Others, others uh, need to see Jesus in you, and so there needs to be something in you when that, that is different about you, that is changed about you, that, that speaks to the fact that there is something different about you. And that, that that is different about you is that you have something on the inside that bears you up even when stuff doesn't go right in life. And what this is is the word of truth, the word of God that, that grows in you as, as you allow the word to truly infect your life. So James says the word is like a strong root that has been engrafted into you. And then in verse 22, he comes with a, probably a verse that uh, many people view as one of the pivotal verses of the book of James right here in the first chapter, verse 22. Notice what it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. James kind of puts in a little punch to us and says, look, I know you're hearing what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is you can say amen to, to, to this word all you want to, but if you don't do it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't bless you. I mean, right now, you can walk out of here and you say, what did pastor do, say today? And pastor said that the word of God is intended to graft itself on the inside of me so that when negative things happen, I can be stable and strong and I don't fall apart. And when that happens, others see, man, there's something different about him. And, and it's Jesus on the inside of me that's different. And you can amen that all day long. But if you don't do this, if you just hear this and don't do this, James says, you are only deceiving yourself. You know what I think James has in mind here? I think James has in mind the conclusion of the message that his half-brother Jesus spoke in the most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave. The most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave was the Sermon on the Mount. 
In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus goes up on the mount, and Jesus has thousands of people there, and Jesus starts teaching them on the mount. And you remember what he starts with? With, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Which means, blessed are you when you know your heart needs God. That's what he's saying to them. Blessed are those who mourn. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, not moan. Not moan. But blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who have legitimate pain, for they shall be comforted. See, this is Jesus. This is how he's starting off his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And he goes on with blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And those of you that have been trained well on these verses know what the word blessed really means, right? It, yeah, right. It comes from the Greek word markurios, which can just as easily be, ha- be translated happy. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy are those who mourn, for when they mourn, God can come in and comfort them. Happy are you when you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for things of God, because God can come in and fill you up with that. Rather than happy are those who get more stuff and have more money. God can't help you with that. But if you're hungry for him, he can get more of him into you. If you're hungry for the word of God, he can get more of the word of God into you. God can do something about that. So you ought to be happy about that. And he goes on for two more chapters with things like that. In Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. And he concludes all of this Sermon on the Mount, which basically is the constitution of the kingdom of God. Everybody say, I live in a kingdom. You live in the kingdom of God. If you belong to Christ, I'm looking right now. I'm looking at a piece of the kingdom of God sitting right here in this room. I'm part of the kingdom of God. You're part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has rules. It has regulations. It has laws. It has boundaries. It has provisions. You are not of this world. You are just passing through this world. And you belong somewhere else. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God I'm going there one day. Thank God this is not the end. Man, if I thought this was all I had to look forward to in life, life would be sad. But man, I'm going to a greater place. I'm going to a kingdom of God. And that kingdom has a constitution just like our country has a constitution. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the constitution of the kingdom of God. It's Jesus saying, Here are, here's what the kingdom of God is all about. And at the end of his message, toward the end in Matthew 7, James, I think, remembering those words that he heard his half-brother preach on the mountain, says to all of us in verse 22, he says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And here's why. Because he remembered, this is what Jesus said. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe. When Jesus got through saying what he said to these people, these people say, man, somebody's been teaching us that's not of this world, that's not like these other preachers and these Bible teachers. This guy's something different than that. And and they just sensed his authority that he knew what he was talking about. Well, what did he say? He said, listen, I'm saying things to you that if you just hear these things and don't do them, you're going to be foolish. If you just hear stuff and walk away saying that sounded good, but you don't live it out, You are deceiving yourself. You are foolish. You're like a foolish person who builds a house on sand, and when the wind blows, you're you're astonished that your house blew away. Well, it's because you've been believing a lie. You're believing something that's not real, that you can belong to the kingdom and not demonstrate that by obeying the word of truth. 
And James says, this is one of the things, these are one of the barometers, these are one of the, these are one of the attributes of the kingdom that you can evaluate and say, am I really real? Do I really belong to Christ? Am I fulfilling my purpose in life? Am I allowing others to see Christ live through me? And James says, because the Word of God is like a root that engrafts itself in you. And when that root engrafts itself in you, it brings with with it a stability and a strength that causes you to live in a different way. So get that Word in you. (laughs) Say, Lord, engraft it in me. Yeah, I want it. Not just add it on to my life, but I want the Word of God engrafted in me. And so then James says, okay, don't deceive yourself. Be a, be a doer of the Word. Here's the second simile that James says. The Word of God is like a root that engrafts itself into you. Secondly, the Word of God is like a mirror that exposes the real you. In other words, James says, the, God gives you his word not only to give you strength and engraft stuff in you, but he also gives you the word to look at your life compared to the word and decide whether you're living up to what the word says your life is supposed to look like. But, but he's going to do this in a negative way, and let me just show you what he's going to do. He's going to tell you how not to look at the word of God in this next verse. Not, not watch, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So he says the word is like a mirror, and this is and, and this is not how you are not supposed to operate looking at a mirror. All right, okay, hang on. All right, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Verse twenty-two. All right, here we go. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So James is saying the Word of God is intended to be a mirror that reflects you to yourself, that you look into. And he says, so don't be like a man who very hurriedly walks by a mirror and just glances at it and then goes away from it and forgets what he saw in the mirror. But let me give you a little bit richer uh, word about this, all right, because Uh, nowadays is different than James Day when he said this to them. When he said this to them, uh, they understood what he was saying. I don't think we really understand what he was saying because our mirrors nowadays are different from the mirrors in James's day. Our our, Our mirrors nowadays are made with a clear piece of glass sitting on top of a thin metallic silver lining. Well, that type of mirror, when you look into it, gives you a perfect reflection of what you are because you have the pure glass and the metallic silver behind it and it reflects perfectly and and, and intensely the image that is glaring into it. The mirror of James's day would not have been like this glass mirror with the metallic behind it because this mirror was not invented until 1835. The mirror of James's day would have been a piece of bronze, shined up, buffed up real good. It might have been even a piece of tin that was buffed up and shined up. It could have even been for poorer people, a rock that was shined up and made shiny enough to kind of have just a little bit of an image in there. And, and, and so it wouldn't have been glass and metallic because until, until, a, German, until a German chemist and created in 1835 the metal, the way to attach metallic film to the back of glass, uh, those mirrors didn't exist. And I will remind you that it might have been a piece of bronze or a piece of tin or, or a rock that was shiny. And just think about this. What else is saying? It's saying that, you know where these mirrors were kept? In somebody's house. You know how this house was lit in those days? With a little tiny oil lamp or a little tiny candle. So most of the t- houses were dark and dim. So what, I'm, what, what I want you to see is James has given us a picture of a, of, a, of a man in a hurry walking past a mirror, a bad mirror, a weak mirror in a poorly lit house and then forgetting what he even looked like. So, so uh, James says, don't be like a, 
a man in a hurry looking at a bad mirror in a bad light and, and, and think that that does anything into your life. What is he saying to us? He's saying, quit trying to get little pieces of God's Word. Sit down and let God's Word take a hold of your heart. Quit trying to read the Bible through in a year. Even though it's, you know, admirable that you could read the Bible through, you want to read it through in a year? Why do you want to do that? So you can check it off your checklist and say, I've read the Bible through. James said it would do you better to sit down and read about three or four verses and let God speak those three or four verses to you and get you living those three or four verses than to read those 12 chapters it's going to take for you to keep on track to read the Word of God in a year. James says, look, don't be a person in a hurry trying to grab a little bit and piece of the Word of God. Don't wake up in the morning and spend five minutes saying, okay, God, speak to me at best, and then going away and maybe at night before you go to sleep, open the Bible and say, okay, God, speak to me. So you got about five minutes in the morning and about five minutes at night. The Word of God is not going to affect you in any way if this is the way you receive it. You can't be in a hurry. You have to let the Lord speak to you so that the Word of God can let you see what you really are, can expose you to yourself because you need to see what you are. It's important what you see, like the old country hillbilly that went down to the trailer park trash dump. You heard about him? Went down to the trailer park trash dump. Man, he'd never been out of the hills and when he got down there, he found this box. He didn't know what it was, and he picked it up, and it started crackling and pop. And it was a battery, old battery radio, and it was just scared him, and he threw it away, you know, and he didn't know what it was. And so he kept looking around, and he found a little piece of a mirror. He had never seen a mirror before, and he picked it up, and he looked into it, and, and it had a, like a little tiny frame around it, and he looked into that mirror, and he said, hmm, I didn't know my old pappy ever had his picture took. <laughs> and he, so he put it in his pocket, and he carried it home with him. And when he got home, it was a valuable thing, and he didn't want anybody playing with it, so he took it, and he put it under his mattress in his bedroom. Well, his wife saw him, and when he wasn't there, she snuck into the room, and she oh, picked that mattress up, and she got that mirror out, and she looked in that mirror. And she said, huh, so that's the old hag he's been running with. <laughs> what I'm saying to you, what I'm saying to you is, it matters what you see. It matters what you're looking at. Do you know what you are looking at? Do you see what you need to see in this word of God for your life? So James says the Word of God is like a strong root that is engrafted in you that brings stability beyond yourself. The Word of God is like a mirror that reflects you to yourself. Do you see, do you see the respect for the Word of God James is trying to lay on us? He's trying to say, yeah, the Word of God is unbelievable, and it, it really matters. And so let's go to the next one. The Word of God is like, oh, and this is probably one of the greatest ones right here. The Word of God is like a perfect law that gives liberty. God is like a strong root. God is like a mirror. And now God's Word is like a perfect law that brings liberty in your life. Everything in your life comes down to blessing or shipwreck, according to James, based on how you receive the Word of God. Did you hear what I just said? Everything. How much is everything? Everything. All right, if I say everything in life, what do you think? My bank account, my job, my relationships, my family, my income, my neighborhood. I mean, I'm telling you, everything in life comes down to either shipwreck or blessing based on how we receive the Word of God. And James now will tell us in just a moment in this passage that the Word of God is a perfect law of liberty. And this is important 
Because that's exactly opposite of what the world we live in tells us the Word of God is. The, word of the world that we live in, the unbelieving world, has given us the idea that the Word of God is not liberating, it's not setting us free, it's putting us in bondage. The unbelieving world says the Word of God uh, constricts us. The Word of God uh, 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 takes away our fun. The Word of God gives us all kind of regulations and laws that are intended to make it where life's no fun anymore and we can't do this and we can't do that. And, and so James is saying the exact opposite of what, of, of, of what the world says. He says the perfect law of God is intended to bring liberty. Now, I want you to hear this. Any law that is created, the purpose of that law is to give us more freedom, not take away our freedom. And let me just show you what I mean. Our band gets up here and just did it this morning. By the way, this is my favorite band in all the world. That's right. I listen to them. Yeah, I put them on, man. I've got a little, I've got one of those little Bose tube deals, and man, I put that thing and I pump them out and I listen to them and I get in the backyard, I'm working, I'm listening to them. I get in the shower, I'm listening to them. I love to hear them, everything about them. I hear them lots because they do, because they follow the law. I'm just saying that if they got up here and just indiscriminately started playing notes and rhythms and singing melodies that, that, you know, Justin had a melody he did, and John liked this other melody better, and then Crystal, she didn't like either one of those. She just liked this other one, and Tanya didn't like the notes they were singing, and Wesley said, that's the wrong rhythm, and he just took off on any rhythm he thought was good. What, what would it sound like? It would be a train wreck, wouldn't it? It would be a catastrophe because there are laws to music. Laws of intonation, laws of rhythm, laws of harmony. Music has laws. And because the band follows the laws of music, when they do it, we get blessed by it because it sounds great, it's triumphant, and we can receive what God wants to say to us through music performed by the perfect laws of music. You, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, traffic laws out here, traffic laws are not intended to take away your fun. Traffic laws are not intended to make it, to restrict you. They're intended to bless you. Because if there weren't any traffic laws, many of us would not be alive. And we would all be in danger as soon as our wheels hit the highway out there because what if somebody says, I don't want to obey that stop sign. So they just blew right through. These are my roads. I pay through with them. I pay for them with my taxes, and ain't no bunch of policemen gonna tell me what to do on my own roads. And so I don't obey the perfect law of traffic. What does that mean? That means we have the perfect law to kill our crazy selves. It means we, it mean, but if we're all gonna have the freedom to arrive where we're going and live another day, we all have to obey the perfect laws of, tra- of traffic. What about sports? What about football? Does it have some rules that have to be obeyed? It sure does. What would happen if the rules weren't obeyed? What would happen if these big 300-pound guys that run the 40 and 4 or 5 could just reach over and get the little 180-pound guy and just stick him in the ground like you're snuffing out a cigarette butt? How about that? Then we wouldn't have a game anymore because there wouldn't be any quarterbacks left and there wouldn't be any running backs left. And there'd be all these big linemen up here, you know, lining up against each other and grunting and pushing, but nobody to run, nobody to throw. Because, but because there are rules, we get to enjoy the game that is intended to be played by these perfect laws of football or baseball or basketball or anything. Do you see what I'm saying? That laws are intended not to restrict. Laws are intended to set you free. And what I'm saying about the Word of God and what James is saying about the Word of God is the Word of God is a perfect law that sets you free. 
It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't tie you up. It sets you free. And, 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 and let me pull a verse back up again because I want you to see this. Uh, but he who, look here, looks into the perfect law of God. You know what that, what that means? It means to bend into. Now, I'm going to show you what, what this is. This, see, to somebody like me, that's exciting. And I know you're going, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. You know, and, oh, that just doesn't bless me, Pastor. Well, listen to this. That word looks into, and he who looks into means he who bends into. If you want to see a picture of somebody bending into the Word of God, read John 20. In John 20, Mary comes and tells Peter and John that she's, that the tomb's empty and that Christ is not there anymore. And they say, what? And she says, honestly, the tomb is empty and, and he's not there anymore. And, and Peter and John, John being younger than Peter, John outruns Peter to the tomb. So John gets there first to the tomb and he stops at the door and he bends in to the tomb to look and see if he can see Jesus. I mean, he's so anxious to see whether it's true or not, but he's so respectful of the boundary of the tomb. John, who gets there first, stops and bends into the tomb to see if the word is true because he's hungry to know, is this true? Is this real? I got to see this for myself. And then here comes old Peter who's behind. He's an older guy. And here comes Peter Blumber busting up into there. And Peter doesn't even stop at the door. He just blunders right into the tomb. And, then, and, and just finds himself right in the tomb. Didn't even stop at the door, just ran right through the thing. What am I saying? I'm saying that James says we are to bend into the word. In other words, we're to be so hungry, we're to be so seeking about the word of God that we're, we actually cannot wait to see what God is going to say. That, we, that it is so profoundly captivating and so profoundly necessary in our life that, that we're anxious to see. We can't wait. We bend in. We look. You know, we're bending toward it. Come on, say something to us. Can we see it? Can we hear I mean, that is a picture of being, of being anxious and, and, and receptive and, and, and can't wait. Just like it is when it's time to come to church. I know every one of you can't wait to get here to church. You say, what are they going to do today? What are they going to sing today? What is God going to say to me today? What's that crazy preacher going to do? Is he going to get more than one verse? You know. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it, Virginia. Sweet. Uh, but, 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 but you see what it means? You, you anticipate. Your, your anticipation is so stout that you just, you, you, you want to get as close as you can and you just clean on in, lean on in. So, so you just may not be much closer, but you're a little closer to it than you were and you're just leaning into the Word of God. Is that how you receive the Word of God? Is that how you are challenged by the Word of God? Or are you that guy walking past that mirror that's in a dark place in a bad mirror and going, uh -huh, I look good. And then it's, that's about as much consideration as you give the word of God. You know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Hey, I don't do that. I'm fine. Yeah. What about those other eight? You no. Know, I mean, this is, what I'm, this is what he's talking about. This is what James is saying to us. I'm telling you, James, I mean, he's not kidding about this. He's saying... If you want the Word of God to change your life, this is how it changes your life. And if it doesn't change your life, now listen to this. If it doesn't change your life, you are certainly going to shipwreck yep. in life because right under the surface of that water are these gigantic rocks and crags and you are going to jam and your hull's going to break and your boat's going to sink. You are inevitably going to sink in life because life has rocks under the surface that you can't see and you don't know is there and they're going to surprise you at the least opportune time and you're going down with the ship, right? If you don't, if you don't let this thing grasp you, that's what's going to happen to you. So everything comes down to blessing or shipwreck what, based on how you receive the Word of God. Now, you might say, how do I know if I'm leaning into the Word of God? Well, 
there are four things that are on your outline. And it's well past my time, of course. <laughs> so let's stop and let's get these. Let's stop and let's get these four next week now because I don't want you to miss them. <laughs>